Aloha. Welcome to another episode of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campania. Many people believe that education can be the silver bullet or the linchpin that can help solve problems like homelessness, drug addiction, social divisions, and income inequality. And in Hawaii, of all places, where our many intertwined cultures all cherish our keiki and do all we can to open doors for their successes, we assume that a high priority is placed on having a world-class educational system. But is it? On this show, we talk about the programs available to our keiki, the quality of our facilities and infrastructure, addressing deferred maintenance, increasing the number of cool rooms for our keiki and teachers, a more comprehensive curriculum approach, as well as appropriately recognizing and valuing our teachers and administrative staff. And perhaps most importantly, what life and career opportunities are we providing for our keiki to thrive today and tomorrow? On today's show, we have the opportunity to talk with one of the leaders in our community. We have State Representative Matthew Lepresti. He is representative of House District 41 out in EVA. And he's been one of the leaders for the, really, the, the educational movement for the last several years. So we appreciate the opportunity to have a good conversation with him today. And we're looking forward to learning a bit of what his thoughts are. Uh, as we go. So thank you so much. Mahalo for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I uh, truly appreciate the opportunity. So, okay. Um, let's get a little bit of background. Okay, so I know that you are, you're, you're a PhD, you're a philosophy PhD, correct? That's right. And you're also a professor. Yes. Where do you teach? I'm an associate professor of philosophy and humanities at Hawaii Pacific University, and I also chair the Asian and, Asian and Pacific Studies program over there. Okay, excellent, excellent. And how long have you been doing that? Uh, I started teaching at HPU in 2004, and uh, I've been teaching philosophy since 1999. Oh, so, great. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. I know that um, hearing some conversations with some students over at uh, University of Hawaii in particular, they talk about how there aren't a lot of opportunities for philosophy majors, if, or, or for that matter, when you get into graduate school, mm -hmm. uh, the opportunities, and how they seem to be dwindling. Is, is, is there an, a concern with regards to the, that philosophy well, curriculum? Well, I think, I think we're having a proliferation of PhDs across the board, uh, not just in the humanities, but you know, one of the primary jobs for a PhD is, is tends to be teaching um, at university levels. But the great thing about philosophy, as a philosophers ancient and new have proven, you can do anything with it. And it's you know the basis of all critical thinking, and it's the basis of all the sciences. Yeah. Um, so, um, I guess I'm living proof. I'm you know not just a professor. I'm in politics, and That's right. I have other friends who've been in business and, and very successful in That's right. whatever That's they choose. And not only are you in politics, uh, you are making changes. Trying. Uh, I, I know progress. it's a struggle. Yes. I know it's a struggle. But yes, we yes. Uh, many of us who who pay attention uh, certainly to politics, but to education know what you've been doing and, and what you've been trying to uh, to accomplish. And I know that many people are appreciative of that. I myself am one, so. Thank you. Um, so, okay, so this is your, uh, you, have, you have completed two years now in the State House. That's right. And what are your thoughts on your first two years? Just in general or in education? In general, briefly in general, and then education. Well, in general, um, speaking as a, as a philosopher, as somebody who's been trained as an academic, it's extremely rewarding because whereas I've been teaching about these ideas of where does the idea of liberty and where does the idea of rights and what's the justification for government power and oversight, where do these things come from, and, and talking about them in terms of moral and ethical issues, you know, I've been doing that for more than a decade. And so now to be in a position where actually I, I get to see where the rubber meets the road, it's, it's really applied philosophy. Yeah. And so it's very exciting in that way. Uh, whereas as an academic, you may affect people's lives over the course of their lives, and they may affect their children's worldviews and everything. And that can change the world. Uh, and it does change the world. We know that as educators. But to, s to be able to have that immediate gratification of seeing your efforts pay off dividends that as that happens is really 
quite unique as a philosopher. Yeah. So I get both the abstract and the practical. Yeah. It's, it's really I, I really like the applied philosophy. Yeah. That, that phrase in itself, I think, is going to stick with me. Politics is applied philosophy. It certainly is. Yeah. I like that idea. So it's, there are a lot of good, interesting thoughts we've had over the, uh, uh, over the course of this show, um, and that's one of them, so I appreciate yeah. that. So. Okay, uh, so now you're heading into this election cycle. Mm -hmm. um, you're excitedly entering this election cycle, or, or now that you've done it once, you're like, okay, uh, where are you with that? Well, I, 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 it's, it's part of the job, you know. The effort it takes to get elected is so tremendous that um, just the momentum of that work really carries you through, at least, I mean, every two years you're, you have to run again in the state house, so... Um, that's just part of the job. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm honestly, I'm a bit of a reluctant politician. I never thought I'd get into politics. You know, I, I'm 42 and I, I didn't get involved uh, or elected until I was 40. So it's not like, you know, I came out of college. It's like, this is what I want to do with my life. Um, but I, I feel a moral obligation. I felt a moral obligation to get involved and run. And I, and I still have that urgency to be involved and to stick around for some time. And that's the key, isn't it? Yeah. You have that personal urgency and partially because you've been involved and you have seen actual policy happen and then you have been able to drive some of it. Now you're like, okay, now I know how this works. I a little bit. I know a little bit more about how this works. <laughs> you've been involved in successful policy making. So now you're like, okay, yeah. I, I've been wedded and now it's time to go do some more. Certainly. And at any time you really want to get something meaningful passed, and this is from conversations I've had with veterans who've been around the system for a long time, they say it can take up to six years. And that's basically three biennial sessions. Yes. Um, so, and I, I can see how and why, that, why that's the case. Some of the things that we passed and finally became law this last session, they weren't brand new ideas proposed. They had been proposed over six years, you know, and that and seems to be kind of average. Go. Yeah, there, there's, any time you propose any change in government, uh, for, pardon my French, you're going to piss people off <laughs> yeah. because there's status quo and people have invested structures of power and control yeah. in the status quo. And so when you, when you suggest any kind of changes, that, that upsets the apple cart a little bit. Yeah. And that's why it's not going to be an immediate change, but you, it kind of puts people on notice. This is an idea and they don't like it, and then you come back the next year, more people are more comfortable with it, it moves a little further, and you come back with it the next time, and it, you know, it's getting a conference committee, and, and, and maybe actually becomes law. Um, and I understand the human psychology behind that, uh, but it's frustrating as a citizen, because you know, all of us and the people watching the show, they know there's a lot of things wrong with government, and things that they want to see um, more urgency, um, things being fixed and solved, and government is very slow. Uh, so that's frustrating, yeah, but being in it now, I have an insider perspective as to how and why that is. I'm still not okay with it, though. No, it, so. it, we always want the change that we find value in, that we think is important, we always want to happen sooner than Of course. Of course. So, no, I, but I, no, I appreciate that. And you have been able to accomplish a few things. So I, would, I do want to jump back into education. So um, the second half of that question was your first two years with regards to education. What from the perspective of a policymaker, from a legislator, and trying to improve education, what has been your experience in the past two years? Well, Carl, I mean, one of the reasons I ran was because I was disappointed in how the state handled education. My wife's a teacher, mm -hmm. and I'm obviously an educator, too. Um, but the problem in my district in Eva Beach, uh, it's, it's so bad that we can't even spend too much time even talking about what goes on in the classroom because we don't have enough classrooms. Yeah. You know, the infrastructure isn't there. Um, there's a great saying I, I heard recently that if you're walking across a field and you find a turtle on a fence, it didn't get there by itself. Somebody put it there. And it's your obligation to try to get that turtle down. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take some time. And you, that's not why you're walking through that field, but you have that problem and you got to deal with that before you can get to the things you want. And I do want to some time soon get into more policy about what goes on in the classroom, like with the ESSA and, and these sorts of things. But in my district and, and throughout the Leeward Coast, I think there's been systematic neglect and a lack of planning and infrastructure for decades. Mm -hmm. um, so after my first term, just two years in office, uh, I just have a better idea of what that is. But we've actually made tremendous progress. 
Yes, um, tell us about, uh, let's start with, because I know mm -hmm. there's been, there was a successful build this year, um, but tell us, last year you did a Cool Rooms, um, you organized a Cool Rooms event, really. Yeah, it was Cool Schools Forever. Yeah. So, you know, my first term in office in 2015, uh, we got about $8 million for Ever Beach just for the AC because when I ran, that was my top priority. Yeah. And that was the number one issue that I kept hearing from, from parents and students, that it's too damn hot in the classrooms. They can't focus, right? Yeah. Um, I quickly learned that that was just one of the problems. We also didn't have enough classrooms. But um, so my first term, we got $8 million, five for Elima, a couple for, I think, Kaimiloa, uh, two million for Ever Beach L, uh, nearly a million for Ever L. And that was all just for AC. But before they could even install that, they had to redo all the electrical work on these campuses. Yeah. Um, so we made a lot of progress on that. But I wasn't going to rest on my laurels in between session uh, because it was still hot. And it'll take, even when we pass the budget and the governor releases the money, it still takes a year and a half or two to just to get everything done. Mm -hmm. So the kids were still suffering. So one day, my office got a phone call from a concerned mother at Eva, Eva Elementary. And she was pleading. She was very upset. It's like, if my kid could just get one fan in his classroom, you know, it would make a world of difference. And, and me and my office manager thought about that. It's like, well, sh I'll, I'll go buy the fan. Let's, let's do this. Yeah. And then I realized, well, I, I can ask other people. Why don't we you know, just create an initiative, Cool Schools Forever is just a slogan, uh, get people to donate. And the next thing I know, I had businesses offering discounts for massive purchases. Uh, Uber got involved. Um, uh, some, some great anonymous donors uh, gave quite a lot of money. And we had partners, both private and, and businesses, throughout the community and on the mainland uh, who heard about this through social media. And, and we got uh, nearly 200 fans to the kids in That's a very excellent. short amount of time. That's excellent. Yeah, it was very rewarding. How and, many, and how many classrooms then were you able to do? 200 classrooms or I, out of there? I'm sure they put more than uh, one fan in each classroom. Yeah, but probably. I mean, it was, it was great. It was very really rewarding because it didn't have anything to do with writing legislation. Yeah. It just had to do with leading, leading, and having an idea and taking following care through. Of people taking care right? of the kids, and that's what the job, in my opinion, yeah. is really about. Yeah, 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 we write laws and we vote on laws, we do the budget, but if that's all we do, then that's not leadership. You know, yeah, yeah. that's that's kind of bureaucratic, and yeah, yeah. I'm not here to be a bureaucrat. Yeah, so. you're here to get stuff done. Yeah, yeah, no, so. I greatly appreciate that. So, um, we do have to take a quick little break already. So okay. this it goes really quickly. So when we get back, we're going to have a few other questions. We're going to jump into a few more things. Um, so uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna, and we are thrilled to have Representative Matt Lepresti with us today. See you in a minute. I'm Jay Fidel, CEO of Think Tech Hawaii. We work for the common good. We want to bring people together. We want to create a platform for civic engagement and raise public awareness. You can find us at thinktechhawaii.com. Thanks. Aloha, I'm Chantal Seville, the host of the Savvy Chick Show. You can watch the show every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Honolulu time and enjoy how to be inspired and empowered. If you're a woman or girl, everyone is welcome, but it's really dedicated to you. And we look forward to seeing you. You can also find us on thinktechhawaii.com. See you soon. Aloha. Aloha. Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host at Global Connections here at ThinkTech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Once again, I'm your host, Carl Campagna, and we have with us today from House District 41, Representative Matt Lepresti. Again, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, so one bill that got passed this year that a lot of people are thrilled about was the, the, the solar, or not solar, the cool rooms, the air conditioners in the classrooms That's right. bill. That bill actually got passed. Yeah. Um, so tell us about that. How many, how many schools are we talking about? How much money was it? What, how, what can you tell us? So. Uh, I, I was thrilled, first of all, when, when the governor gave his speech about his agenda for this last session, yeah. and it had to do with AC in the schools, because that's why I ran for office. Yeah. And he promised a 1,000 schools AC'd by the end of the year, and 
uh, some thousand people, classrooms. A, thousand, a thousand classrooms, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, some people balked at that, uh, but I was like, absolutely, let's do it. Let's find the ways that we can make this happen. And I was fortunate enough this last term, I was uh, put onto the finance committee, so I was in a perfect position to, to try to help in any way I could uh, yeah. with, the, with the governor's plan. And we passed it, so it was $100 million to cool a thousand classrooms. And um, they're beginning with the AC priority list, which has four or five, yeah, five of the top 14 schools are in Eva Beach. Uh, oh, Campbell wow. High, actually, Eva Beach Elementary is number one. Uh, then I think Elima, Elima, uh, Elima Intermediate, Campbell High School, Kaimiloa, uh, and then there's a fifth one, I think, somewhere in Kailua, and then a little further down the list is Eva Elementary. So these are all schools that have already, in my understanding, gone out to bid. And that money has already been, I, a lot of that money has already been released, I believe, by the governor to, to get to work and to, to cool nearly that's a thousand. Excellent. That's so, excellent. So yeah. that needs to be, so it's a thousand classrooms, um, which is a great, great start. So the first thing that has to happen in a lot of these schools is, as you suggested, the infrastructure needs to be upgraded. So yeah, they the have to upgrade the electrical. Itself yeah. needs to be upgraded so they can allow these air conditioners to be plugged in right yeah. now. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of questions like, well, if you do the math, that's 100,000 per classroom. And on average, that's true. But if you think about actually what has to be done to the structures, because it's not just electrical upgrades. A lot of this comes with PV. It's about PVAC yeah. so that you have photovoltaic yeah. so that you don't double the, the cost of the, exactly. the, the electrical bill. Exactly. And you can't put PV well. on the roof if the roof's 68 years old and hasn't been reinforced in the last 68. Years. Yes, and many um, of these roofs have had cover upon cover upon cover yeah. and are more problem laden underneath that you don't even know about until you start opening it up. That's right. So I've been there. I know. It's not <laughs> it's not cheap to do yeah. government work anyways, but yeah. when you're dealing with buildings this old and problems this severe that it, it, it costs a bit more money. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well that's first of all congratulations. Yeah, I'm I very proud that of that. Big deal. Um, one another question I have is okay, that's great. What about the next step? Right. So I, I, it's, it's a short, medium, and long term as I look at infrastructure for our schools. The immediate was the AC. We have classrooms in which students can't learn, teachers can't teach, and kids are falling asleep, and it's actually a health and safety hazard. Yeah. And so that had to be addressed first, and we've, we've, we've begun to do that. Um, after that, we need more classrooms. And so, for example, Campbell High School, this class was designed for 1,700 kids, and they have nearly double that now and it's really frustrating and again one of the reasons I ran because the size of our high school is the size of uh, what is it Kaiser uh, the one out nine Haina and, and, and Kaimuki all combined yeah, yeah, yeah. that's our high school right and and it really wow. is it's not just an overcrowding thing it limits the opportunities for the kids because yeah. instead of three basketball teams we got one and we got a great one, and we got a great baseball team, and an outstanding football team, and all these things. But, but that means there are some kids who are not they're left the out, opportunity. right? They're left out. Yeah, and necessarily and so because there's not room. Again, a, a safety uh, condition because there's no places left on that campus to put anything. They've already gotten maxed out on um, portables. They've started to take over the next elementary schools yeah. land and put portables there, and we've gotten them a lot of portables actually in the last couple of years. But you know, these are the, that's just. Uh, really a band-aid to it's get to where we need to yeah. be. Yeah. So we're trying to get uh, the DOE uh, requested I think 35 million for a new classroom, multi-level classroom. We've got them 12 million this year and that's enough for them to do work for one year and then next year come I back. I remember at the beginning of this legislative the session there the was a uh, big article, big conversations that came out and I, I know you were involved in some of the conversation about the amount of money that was being looked at for one building. Yeah. Some people had questions about that because they, they, they just built a, a new elementary school in Kapolei for 40 million and it was 40 classrooms and, uh, so, and it was done in like a year because it was design build. Uh, for whatever reason, the DOE said they can't do design build on this building because they have to shoehorn it in. Uh, like I said, it's very crowded. They have to move um, utilities out of the way, do a lot of prep of the groundwork. I think they have to move some portables. There's a whole lot they have to do before they even break ground. <laughs> So they, they wanted to put the planning in one bucket and I guess the actual construction in another bucket because they, they didn't think they could get somebody to do design build because they weren't even sure what the design would require or something like that. So. Well, okay. I, we can go into that. Yeah, I, I have well, a construction management background and to me that doesn't make any sense. Well, I'm a philosopher. I understand I mean, how there are I've buckets of money and how you need to plan stuff out yeah. in certain ways, but anyway, we won't yeah. go into that. That's what I've been so, told. So. Yes, and, and, that's, and that's totally fine. Um, 
so okay, we've got a picture here of East Copperlake yeah. High School. So what, what's, what's so going this is on the here? third uh, thing because even when we get our new building for okay, James Campbell High School, see that um, that there is. we need not one high school, Carl. We need two high schools. You need two more. We need two you've new got high that schools. many students because you also have Ho'opili coming in, mm -hmm. and that's going to be I, my understanding oh, yeah. is twenty cent, twenty percent larger than Hawaii Kai, oh, wow. a community. Wow. And that's going to come with its own high school, uh, apparently. Okay. Uh, but even before any of that, and that's a 30-year build-out. Yeah. That's a long ways away, and that high school will be built at some point with that. But even before that, we still need another high school to deal with the overcrowding at Campbell, yeah. the overcrowding at Kapolei, and the overcrowding at Waipahu. Because these kids, they can't just go to the next school district over. Those are at capacity as well, yeah. and we're over capacity. Uh, so I've been involved in a lot of discussions with the DOE and UH West Oahu about uh, where is this going to go? Uh, because while there's still a lot of empty land out there, a lot of it's spoken for in, in various ways. Um, and Some the, of it's ag land. A lot of it, a lot of it was. Uh, but the HCDA land that was Barber's Point, you know, there's a great location there, and it's centrally, or at least cl more closely located to Eva Beach. But apparently, the soil might have a contamination problem because yeah. it was a military base and there's, I, I guess, I, it was a I'm shooting range. I'm familiar with some of that. I'm familiar with some of that. And, and there are ways of dealing with that, but you don't want your kids to be going to school yeah. over the top of that. Then right. the other one is a gentry lot, but that's the last lot they, they planned on building a new development and, and you know, uh, do their thing building houses. And then there's a DLNR spot, which is actually in a ravine and, frankly, in my opinion, a terrible location for a new high school. And it's far away from Eva Beach, which is the community it's supposed to serve. Right. So yeah. the best three options aren't good. Yeah. Uh, and and, and the, the, the crappiest thing about it, honestly, is that we can't, as the legislature, appropriate a lot of money to a new high school when the DOE hasn't even picked a location yet. Because yeah. how do you give money for planning? You said you're in construction. Mm -hmm. How do I give you money for planning if I can't even tell you where you're going to plan something? Right. Can you yeah. plan something without you knowing? Can't begin. No, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. And so until the DOE finally selects a damn location, a location we so can't can get them enough to money to, to begin yeah. the process. And yeah, it's really I frustrating. No, I, no, I, so, I, totally, I totally understand that. Um, I, we, we honestly could go into, we can do an entire show on any one of these issues, um, mm, by the way. So we're absolutely. trying to cover a lot of ground here. Yeah. So one of, the, one of the things that comes with that is more classrooms means more teachers. We need a lot more teachers than we currently have already, let mm -hmm. alone adding new schools and new classrooms and what that's going to take. We, uh, I, I believe, and I jump in on this as far as what is needed as from the legislature's perspective, from your perspective, what can be done for what is needed to bring more teachers into the fold? You know, we've had a problem for, I think, well over a decade in the state of trying to recruit and retain teachers. And, and the most glaring, obvious reason is we have the least paid teachers in the nation. Yeah. They're professionals. Yeah. They're not treated like it a lot of times in the media. They're not treated uh, like professionals a lot of times by, by, by the public, and that's unfortunate. But the fact is that they're professionals, and they deserve to have a professional salary. Yes. And if you want good schools, then you need to have good teachers. And if you want good teachers, you have to pay for good teachers. Uh, and instead, what we have is a thousand emergency hires of people without any educative background at all, yeah. who are then being put into classrooms, mm -hmm. which are substandard, and then being expected to teach. And then we wonder, it's like, well, why, why, why aren't our test scores higher? Or, or, why, and then you start blaming you know, the teachers. And then they blame the teachers. And it's like, it's not, it's actually, I would trace it back to the legislature mm -hmm. and to the DOE that we need to fund uh, to pay teachers properly yeah. and to give them a livable salary. It's looking at it, it's, it's really recognizing it as a priority. And yeah. from, from, a, from a citizen perspective, from someone who's been involved in various areas, it does not appear that in the legislature, it does not appear that it has the priority that the people want it to have. And that is the entire educational system. Um, and not sure exactly where that all fits. I know that it's, it's a biennial budget. I know it's $13.5 billion. We have to figure out how we pay for everything. Mm -hmm. But why is it that education is always at the very bottom, at the very last? I'm not sure where we're going to find the money for this and the other. I wouldn't say it's at the very bottom, at the very last. DLNR is terribly underfunded, much worse than than the DOE, but it has not been the priority that it should be. And, and 
you know, that's something that I hope to change. Yeah, well, um, I, I hope to help you there so. uh, as much as I can. Um, now, real quickly, because we only have a few more minutes here to go, real quickly, I want to jump into ESSA, uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act yeah. uh, that President Obama signed, and that we now have the opportunity. A few weeks back, I had uh, Mr. Daryl Galera on, oh, and we good. were talking about, from his perspective, what he wanted to, what he was hoping to achieve. Um, he's the new director or right. like, lead of that whole, uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, what are your thoughts or what is coming down the line to you from the legislative perspective and or uh, from, from the professor perspective mm. with regards to ESSA? I well, think they're both interesting I, to, to know. I can't speak to any possible legislation yet. That's a long ways off to January. Um, but I can say that I think a lot of people in the country are very happy with this yeah. law because we're finally we're getting out of No Child Left Behind. Yeah and we're putting control back locally to the stakeholders in the states, uh, allowing more safer families. You know, I've heard a lot from conservatives and liberals in my district and around the state that they want to have more say in their child's education and what the curriculum is there. And they should have more say. Should, absolutely. And, 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 and the teaching professionals, you know, at a college level, if it's a real university, the faculty make the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And at our schools, the faculty aren't making the curriculum. That's being really sold off to private corporations who also, have, by the way, make the tests. Yeah. And in order to do well on this test, you have to buy my curriculum. Right. And you can say, boy, does that get really, uh, they make a pretty penny off of that. And, and, yeah, exactly. and that all goes, frankly, back to No Child Left Behind yeah. and, and, and the half measures that were taken. The intention the of No Child Left Behind, again, half measures, but the intention was we want to set a standard that we want to raise all the kids up to yeah. that standard. So we still have a standard with the ESSA, and there's still accountability, and there's still, um, what, do you, what do you call it? There's still uh, learning, a lot of learning assessment, obviously, involved. But the states get to have more of a say as to what they want their kids to learn. You know, the kids in state, Hawaii. It's not just state, it's district. I mean, we have oh, yes, one yes. district, but we can be looked at in several ways. We can look at from county to county. We know here in Hawaii, each county is different has different needs, has mm -hmm. different requirements, and really should be looked at differently and be allowed to come up with their own structure. So I, I would hope within the process of this, uh, um, obviously Mr. Glera didn't go too far into any of this as well. Yeah, so with the July, I think it's July, in the early July, I'm going to the ESSA, it's a workshop basically, yeah. uh, for legislators and stakeholders and educators and teachers and administration. Uh, and I'll be partaking in that exactly this discussion as to, well, what do we want to happen with this? Do we need legislative um, bills to try to help out? Because not every problem has a legislative solution. Right. You know, you look at the law books in the state, and there's a lot of laws, lot. and I don't think the, the, the solution to everything is just write another law. Right. There's a lot of policy changes that we can make sure. and implement without heavy lifting like legislation. Yeah. Policy so, changes, the, departmental changes that yeah. can be made, various things. In the These are the discussions stuff. that we're going to have. Yeah, no, I I, no, and what I would love is at an appropriate time after that for you to come back and let us know some more thoughts. And as sure. we, um, for as long as I'm going to be hosting this show, I would love to have you come back and tell us more about upcoming legislation, more about some of the things that are going on I'd like uh, that. that you've heard. So I'd really love the opportunity to have you come back and tell us more. Um, because it, we, I've, had, I've had some students on. So we had um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had three students from Iolani. So we got student perspective. Um, as well as Mr. Glare, as well as yourself, as where I mean, uh, Corey, oh, Rosen Lee, Corey Rosen Lee was here. We've had, we've been able to have a large conversation covering a lot of topics, all about education. So I look forward to continuing this. Unfortunately, our time is done. Oh, really? In fact, I'm a little That's over. Uh, so I apologize for that. So thank you very much for joining us, and thank you to Representative Matt Lepresti for joining us. Um, this is Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Thank you again to the staff and the crew here at Think Tech Hawaii. See you next time. Thank you.